It is time now for The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, my friend. Good evening, Ali. And that breaking news of the night about a U.N. resolution uh, to be brought tomorrow by the United States uh, about a ceasefire uh, is a real turn in this story. I'm going to be here tomorrow night, actually, so we'll, I'll be covering that uh, tomorrow night. You'll be covering it tomorrow night also uh, as one of the big news items of, of of the it's day a tomorrow. massive. It's, it's a, a big massive uh, story, and it it is part of this growing shift in this administration to put pressure not on Israel necessarily on Benjamin Netanyahu and his very unusual policies. Uh, I'm I'm very intrigued to see how this plays out tomorrow morning. Most people who watch us don't watch United Nations proceedings. Right. Tomorrow might be a day to do it. Absolutely, and Ali, before you go, um, it says here the Dow, the Dow closed at. 39,781. Is that high? It's, it's, it's another high. We, we thought it might get 40,000. That might happen right. tomorrow. But as you and I have talked about, weird though it is, the, the stock market continues to hit all time highs. We're looking at 40,000. I remember the days when we were talking the single digit thousands. So mm -hmm. you know, for those of you who are worried about uh, these things, if you got money in an IRA, it's doing pretty well tonight. The, the Biden stock market is, is doing That's pretty exactly well. That's exactly right. Thank you, Alan. Have a good show. Thank you. Well, most Supreme Court justices did not graduate from law school. Of the 114 Supreme Court justices in our nation's history, 49, only 49, actually graduated from law school. The first Chief Justice, John Marshall, attended the very first law school in the country at William & Mary, but did not graduate. Harvard Law School was not invented until 28 years after the United States Supreme Court opened for business, lawyers became lawyers the same way blacksmiths became blacksmiths. Training. You trained as an assistant to a blacksmith, and eventually you could go into business as a blacksmith yourself. Abraham Lincoln, who never even went to elementary school, was entirely self-educated. He read law books, got some training in a law office in Illinois, and eventually became a very good lawyer. The last Supreme Court justice who didn't go to law school was Jimmy Burns, who went from being a South Carolina senator to, to the Supreme Court in 1941. He was, of course, confirmed unanimously without even having a Judiciary Committee confirmation hearing, as was the custom in those days. In fact, Jimmy Burns was confirmed by the Senate on the same day that the Senate received his nomination from the president. He was the last of the no law school Supreme Court justices. Since then, Harvard Law School graduates and Yale Law School graduates have come to dominate the Supreme Court and the rest of the federal judiciary. Now, federal judges are supposed to arrive in their jobs with enough education to actually do their jobs. But in the 21st century, Republican billionaires have decided law school isn't enough. And so they have been hosting federal judges on very expensive vacation trips to luxury resorts, including a luxury ski resort in Deer Valley, Utah, where some of the judges' time is spent on the receiving end of lectures about something called corpus linguistics. Molly Redden reports it all in a new article in Huffington Post under the headline, Inside the Ritzy Retreats Hosting Right-Wing Judges. She reports that corpus linguistics, quote, essentially works like a search engine that returns every example of how a word or phrase was used in a select database of historical texts. But the leading proponents of legal corpus linguistics See it as something more, a powerful new tool to shore up the legitimacy of the conservative legal movement. Now, judges claiming to be interpreting the Constitution as it was originally understood could, could wield the imprimatur of big data. With a 6-3 stranglehold on the Supreme Court and Trump judges dominating federal appeals courts, the right wing has increasingly pushed the legal view that the law must be interpreted based on history and tradition. Yet few have failed to notice how perfectly history in these judges' rendering aligns with current Republican beliefs on issues like guns and abortion, 
Corpus Linguistics offers one way to dodge these criticisms. A judge who could keyword search millions of lines of historical text, the thinking goes, is a judge who could ward off accusations that his version of history was invented for a partisan outcome. The report describes the workings of a nonprofit that calls itself the Judicial Education Institute. The first retreat they hosted for judges was, quote, six days at the Greenbrier, an opulent 11,000-acre West Virginia mountain resort. At least 11 U.S. District and Appeals Court judges listened to speakers vaunt the potential of corpus linguistics in the mornings. In their free time, they could indulge in one of the Greenbrier's four golf courses or miles of trails. Deer Valley, the same ritzy resort where Gwyneth Paltrow skied into legal trouble, provided an even more exclusive backdrop. At least seven federal judges attended. One U.S. district judge, Stephen McGlynn, reported his trip alone cost the Judicial Education Institute $5,558. Now, how do we know how much Judge McGlynn's free trip was worth? It was a mistake. Judge McGlynn disclosed that number by mistake, not realizing that he was not required to disclose how much the trip was worth. And so we don't really know how much the judges are actually taking in the form of vacation luxury. So of the work of re the Republican judges using corpus linguistics, some of it has found its way into Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas's opinions. University of Connecticut Law School professor Anya Bernstein says, a lot of what legal corpus work tends to do is allow you to pick and choose your history. You pick and choose your corpus. You pick and choose what you're putting into the software. You pick and choose your results. Today, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse said this. They've opened up a whole new arena for fake fact-finding with the new so-called history and tradition analysis that they brought to bear on uh, Dobbs, on reproductive rights cases, and in Bruin, on gun rights cases. Because you can fake your way through history and tradition very easily. You just go back into history and you cherry-pick the fake facts that you like. Real historians will come in and say, well, that was ridiculous, but it doesn't matter. You got what you wanted. And the ability to do that fake fact-finding is going to get worse, not better. Leading off our discussion tonight is Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island. He's a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and he chairs the subcommittee on federal courts. He is also the author of Captured, the Corporate Infiltration of American Democracy. Senator, thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight. You know, I read these articles uh, that are all new to me, uh, always thinking, uh, how is Senator Whitehouse reading this? And I'm sure it's not with any element of surprise. Nope, no surprise at all. If you look at the billionaire funded effort to influence our judiciary, they've been picking judges and justices. They've been creating doctrines for them in billionaire funded doctrine factories. They've been presenting them to the judges and justices through billionaire funded front groups that file amicus curiae briefs in cases that are brought by billionaire funded litigation groups. And as indicated here with the Greenbrier and Deer Valley, they're also indoctrinating the judges in the uh, doctrines that they're trying to get them to adopt by taking them to fancy, fancy, fancy resorts so that uh, they can learn what they're supposed to do. And unfortunately, this is not new behavior for a long, long time. Very wealthy special interests have been taking judges to fancy resorts to learn doctrines that will help those special interests win cases in the courtroom. Yeah. And, and when we talk about the, the data searches that they're doing, the, the corpus that you choose, the, which is to say the category of data you want to search, uh, can be designed to produce a certain result. I mean, if, you, if, if people watching this now were imagining us 100 years from now doing such a search and asking for 
Republican senators' views of X. Uh, you will get a bunch of quotes uh, that would fit a certain way of thinking, but would leave out everything that Democratic senators were saying about exactly the same thing at exactly the same time. Yeah, as they say in uh, computer business, garbage in, garbage out. Only in this case, it's not just garbage in, it's specifically chosen garbage in in order to produce the desired garbage out. And then because of the Supreme Court doing this reversion to a history and tradition form of analysis, something that was not the regular form of analysis until Bruin and Dobbs, um, it's opened up this whole field for cherry picking of, of uh, the uh, historic record for the judges on the Supreme Court to create. And weirdly, the uh, hearing, the uh, resort trip that was discussed uh, happened in, I want to say, October of 2022. Mm -hmm. These two decisions, Bruin and Dobbs, that developed the new history and tradition analysis, they were only decided in June of 2022. So it's incredible how fast these billionaire-funded groups were able to get their indoctrination training out to take advantage of this brand new history and tradition standard. That's like four months. You can't even organize a, par you know, a parade in four months. And these people had this all teed up to fit into the history and tradition analysis four months after those were adopted by the court. And before we knew, before I knew, certainly, the techniques they were using in their so-called historical research, we had historians on this program from Harvard, from Yale, from Stanford, uh, finding great fault uh, with the amateur history work done by Supreme Court justices. Yeah, I mean, I'm a trained lawyer, and... Um, I've been doing trial work and litigation and legal analysis for a long, long time. That's what I'm trained for. And that's what Supreme Court justices are trained for. They are not trained historians. And particularly if they come at it with a bias, because the same billionaires who got them put on the court want them to adopt a particular. Control room, tell me, to, am I the only one who doesn't have sound? I don't have um, any. Okay. Okay, we're back to oh, I'm there. Lines. Okay, I'm back. Okay, go ahead. No, I was just going to say the, um, the 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 notion that this is an accident is completely mistaken. It's not just bad history; it's deliberately contorting history to get to results that you, the same donors who got you on the court want you to arrive at and have told you how to get at through all the amicus briefs that they file in these little flotillas of front group briefs. It is a systematized indoctrination of a court that has been captured. Uh, what is at stake in the presidential election when you look at the potential uh, judicial nominees of a second term President Biden or another Trump term? It's pretty stark. Um, the Trump appointments have been really dramatic in terms of taking away rights from people. And if with a 6-3 majority, it's a pretty powerful majority. But if you got to, you know, 7-2, to two, it gets even wilder. And it also builds in over a longer period of time the ability of big billionaire donors to manipulate and maintain and cosset a Supreme Court that will do things to the American public that even conservative Republicans would never do in Congress because they'd get voted out. So it's a really, really dangerous end run around the American democratic political system that gets only more dangerous and dynamic as the majority grows. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, thank you very much for joining us once again tonight. Thanks, and sorry about the mute. Thank you. And coming up, Joe Biden has a great new joke about Donald Trump's personal financial troubles, which include the New York attorney general preparing to move against Donald Trump's assets next week to satisfy the $464 million civil judgment that Donald Trump now owes the state of New York. That's next. Joe Biden is getting big laughs at his private fundraisers with this joke. 
Just the other day, a defeated looking guy came up to me and said, Mr. President, I need your help. I'm being crushed with debt. I'm completely wiped out. I had to say, Donald, I can't help you. Huge laughs at Democratic fundraisers. And Donald Trump is getting big laughs with his crybaby social media posts about not actually being rich enough to handle the financial trouble he is now in in the state of New York with a $464 million civil judgment against him for business fraud. His crybaby post this morning said, if I sold assets and then won the appeal, the assets would be gone forever. Yeah, that's what happens when you sell stuff. It's gone. And then with the money you get from selling stuff, you can maybe buy something else. You know, like when we sell our cars and then buy new cars, it's how the auto industry works. New York's Attorney General Letitia James is preparing to close in on Donald Trump's assets starting next week after Monday's deadline for Donald Trump to put up a bond that guarantees the judgment will be paid if and when Donald Trump loses his appeal. Because Donald Trump cannot afford to put up that bond, the attorney general will have a right to begin collecting the judgment while Donald Trump is appealing the case. The attorney general has registered the judgment in Westchester County as well as in Manhattan. Bloomberg reports New York Attorney General Letitia James registered the judgment on March 6th, according to the Westchester County Clerk's online database. The filing didn't give a reason for the registration or identify any Trump assets, but it will allow Attorney General James to more easily secure liens should she decide to do so on two of the real estate mogul's most valuable properties, Trump National Golf Club Westchester and the mostly undeveloped 212-acre Seven Springs Estate. And in the criminal case against Donald Trump in Manhattan for business fraud in covering up hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels, District Attorney Alvin Bragg told the judge today in writing, enough is enough. The district attorney wrote, defendant has taken every possible step to evade accountability in this case for more than a year. He sought to deter the grand jury from considering the charges by promising death and destruction. If indicted, he sought to intimidate the district attorney and this office by posting a photo of himself wielding a baseball bat at the back of the district attorney's head. Enough is enough. These tactics by defendant and defense counsel should be stopped. A grand jury of regular New Yorkers indicted Donald Trump on 34 felony counts of falsifying business records to conceal criminal efforts to corrupt the 2016 presidential election. This court held that the evidence supported those charges. The people respectfully urge this court to reject defendant's motion in its entirety and... After the scheduled hearing on March 25th, proceed to trial on the timeline set forth by the court in its March 15th order. Joining us now is Adam Pollack, former assistant attorney general for the state of New York. Also with us, Glenn Kirshner, former federal prosecutor and an MSNBC legal analyst. And Glenn, let me begin with you on what District Attorney Alvin Bragg filed today uh, and what that is going to mean possibly in terms of a trial date. You know, Lawrence, I think it's important that D.A. Bragg set out how they have been diligent all along the way, trying to give over all of the discovery that Donald Trump is entitled to and then some. Now, what he really had to unravel for the court was how how is it that he got a hold of some of this documentation late, particularly regarding uh, Michael Cohen's federal case. But he laid out how all along they had been asking the Southern District of New York U.S. Attorney's Office, an arm of the Department of Justice, for these materials. And there was a significant delay in getting them. But once they got them, they promptly turned them over. And a couple of important things there. One, he references in the motion that most of the documents were irrelevant. Many of the documents were inculpatory, incriminating. So they weren't exonerating of Donald Trump. It was just more incriminating evidence that was by and large, duplicative of some of what Donald Trump had already received in discovery. But what people may not know is whatever was in the possession of the Department of Justice, the, the New York District uh, um, U.S. Attorney's Office, is not in the possession of state court prosecutors, different sovereigns, different jurisdictions. And just because the feds have it 
doesn't mean the states have it. The states have to request or subpoena it from the feds. And there was a delay. But importantly, Alvin Bragg said, listen, we've gone through it. We've given it over. And there is no need for any more delay. So the uh, April 25th trial date is, is appropriate. And let's get this justice show on the road. Uh, Adam Pollack, uh, we're so grateful to have your expertise about how things work inside the attorney general's office of the state of New York. Uh, this I've been assuming all along there's no way anyone's going to provide a bond for Donald Trump on this. So we're going to get to Monday. The deadline's going to expire. What happens on Tuesday? Look, I think it's going to be an interesting day, although maybe not a made-for-TV moment. There won't be a swarm oh, of... Oh, wait till you see what we do with it. <laughs> <laughs> there might not be a swarm of attorneys general coming out to seize properties. But what we should see on Monday, or we should see after the expiration of the deadline, is a few devices used to enforce the judgment. One is bank executions. The attorney general can enlist the sheriff or the marshal, kind of a Wild West meets New York City, to go execute on bank on banks on assets held in financial institutions like banks or others to what does execute mean so execute nobody's dying right but the assets get seized by the sheriff and turned over to the attorney general's office to the state of new york right away right away no judicial process involved the statute says forthwith you oh, okay forthwith so the sheriff or the marshal is entitled to 5% commission. They call it poundage. It's kind of an archaic old name. They get their 5%, and the rest of the money should go to the state of New York. Wow. The sheriff, sheriffs in Westchester and Manhattan County must be pretty excited about this. And Glenn Kirshner, uh, Judge Ngoron issued an interesting uh, amendment to his orders on this, uh, saying that the monitor, the, the monitor of Trump's businesses, who he already appointed, Barbara Jones, uh, should be studying, quote, any representations made by Trump organization in connection with securing such bonds. So uh, Donald Trump claims that in the last month they've been trying to get this money somewhere from these different companies, including the Chubb Insurance Company. Uh, the judge is saying uh, to Barbara Jones, get your hands on every single thing they said to the Chubb Insurance Company to see what, what they actually said to them about this. Yeah, Lawrence, it's interesting. It feels like Judge N. Goran promoted uh, former Judge Barbara Jones to an enhanced um, uh, monitor and uh, that she is to guard against, among other things, any transfer or dissipation of any assets by Donald Trump. And I read through Judge N. Goran's order, and I have to admit my favorite part is when he empowers Barbara Jones to hire any and all outside professionals to help guard against wrongful transfer or dissipation of any of Trump's assets, and Donald Trump has to pay for it. So it is, I think, poetic justice that Donald Trump is going to be hiring the watchdogs who will be keeping guard over Donald Trump to make sure he doesn't mishandle any of his assets. Adam Pollack, how do, how do these new du duties that Barbara Jones have intersect with what the attorney general is trying to accomplish? So they intersect really neatly. The attorney general's office can serve what's called a restraining notice. Doesn't have to be issued by the court, just by the AG's office. And it says, you, the judgment debtor, he's no longer the defendant because he's been held liable. He's now the judgment debtor. You, the judgment debtor, don't spend any money. You owe the people of the state of New York $460 million. Until we're paid, we don't want you out there transferring money and spending money. And there's a monitor on top of the organization watching every transfer, reporting to her. So if he spends money in defiance of a restraining notice, and we should expect to see a restraining notice on Monday, then he can be held in contempt of court. And my impression is that Justice Engoron would swiftly— He's keenly paying attention to this case, which swiftly hold Trump in contempt of court. Can he continue to pay salaries within the business? Are, is there, are you saying he can't embark on new financial ventures? New financial ventures, spending, transferring assets, any kind of financial engagements that are outside would be in violation of a restraining notice. Uh, Glenn Kirshner, Donald Trump has never had to live like this before.
No. And, you know, I think the defining moment was when uh, he authorized his lawyers to file that pleading in court that admitted he doesn't have the money to put up uh, in order to perfect his appeal and stave off uh, New York Attorney General Tish James beginning to seize his assets. He can't get a bond. Nobody will do business with him. And I have to believe, Lawrence, that was mortifying for him to finally have to expose himself as not quite being the the titan of finance that he has always pretended to be. Glenn Kirshner, Adam Pollack, thank you both very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Lawrence. And coming up, one reason I don't miss working in the Senate is that the senators I worked with and respected the most are gone. But one of them will join us tonight as my next guest. He's the one who I started admiring when I was in elementary school, and he was winning an Olympic gold medal on the USA basketball team. You can count on one finger how many United States senators have been NBA champions. That story is told in a new film produced by Spike Lee and Frank Oz and directed by Mike Tolan and written by Bill Bradley that is now streaming on Max called Rolling Along. An American Story, two-time NBA champion and three-term United States Senator Bill Bradley will be our next guest. Sports Illustrated does not report on United States Senators, except Bill Bradley, who served 18 years in the Senate representing the great state of New Jersey before coming in second to Al Gore in the Democratic presidential primaries in the year 2000. Bill Bradley also served 10 years on the New York Knicks, winning two NBA championships. And before he joined the Knicks, Bill Bradley already had national fame as a member of the winning USA basketball team in the 1964 Olympics and as a basketball star at Princeton, where he won a Rhodes Scholarship that sent him off to England for two years of study when the Knicks wanted him to play professional basketball. Sports Illustrated reports... 35-year-old Bill Bradley wanted to be on the Senate Finance Committee, and when he walked into the Senate in January 1979, he got his wish. On one of his first days on the job, he sat at the end of a table as people testified about provisions of a portion of a multilateral trade negotiation known as the Tokyo Round. Bradley says now, I did not understand one word. It was sad. Fourteen years later, when I became the chief of staff of the Senate Finance Committee, Bill Bradley was the committee's recognized authority on international trade. My boss, the chairman of the committee, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, a former Harvard professor, relied on Bill Bradley's expertise on international trade and taxation. It was a Senate policy version of the teamwork Bill Bradley mastered on the basketball court. The one tip I got about dealing with Senator Bradley before I met him was, don't say anything about basketball. That was the word in the Senate among people in the know. The idea was Bill Bradley worked hard as a senator and didn't want to be thought of as a basketball player in the Senate. The closest we ever came to discussing basketball was when Senator Moynihan was floor managing a major finance committee bill on the Senate floor and that was either going to pass or be defeated by one vote at 2 o'clock in the morning. And Bill Bradley came through the door, hustled over to where I was when Senator Moynihan was up there speaking, and asked me, what's the play? It was one of those moments when your world spins. Here we are in the big game that we're going to win or lose by one point, time's running out, and the great Bill Bradley asks me, what's the play? So imagine my shock and delight when I saw Bill Bradley perform his one-man show in a New York theater, which is now streaming on Max, and the first thing he talked about was the one thing we had never talked about in the decades we've known each other. For those moments on the court when something extraordinary happened, When you saw in your mind's eye the pass that could lead to the pass, that could lead to the basket, before it happened, 
And then when it happened, say a perfectly executed backdoor play, or the two passes, or three quick passes and open man on the other side of the court, there was a rush of joy, a feeling everything was in perfect balance, right there, on the court, with your teammates, before 19,500 people in the new Madison Square Garden, five times more than all the people living in Crystal City. William Warren Bradley grew up in the small town of Crystal City, Missouri, on the banks of the Mississippi River. He played for a Little League baseball team that was turned away from restaurants in Arkansas because the team included black players. It wasn't that much better 20 years later when he was playing for the Knicks. Bill Bradley saw up close the racism that his teammates faced. Bill Bradley was as good at legislating as he was at basketball. He got a hugely important tax reform bill passed when no one thought it was possible. But his most dramatic moment in the Senate was a moment I will never forget. And it was the moment when I was never prouder to say, I work in the same place where Bill Bradley works. The most dramatic moment for me in the Senate came when an all-white California jury found four all-white L.A. police officers not guilty in the beating of an unarmed African-American man named Rodney King. Now, a neighbor caught the beating on videotape, and the whole country had seen it. The officers hitting King with their batons 56 times in 81 seconds. So when the verdict came down not guilty, the country erupted. And I went to the Senate floor to vent my own anger and let anybody know who was watching that somebody understood the injustice. So I was speaking, and I spontaneously picked up a pen from my desk, and I paused, and without saying a word, I hit the podium 56 times in 81 seconds. dehumanizing descriptions of black Americans that have fueled hatred, discrimination, and fear throughout our history. The Honorable Brill Bradley joins us next. I found my place. I stayed 10 years. We won two NBA championships. Standing at center court, with your fist raised in the air, Chills going up and down your spine, a smile frozen on your face, knowing you're the best in the world. Now, that's a thrill. <laughs> and it lasted about 48 hours. <laughs> then you had to go back to practice and try to do it all again the following year. The film is called Rolling Along, an American story produced by Spike Lee and Frank Oz, directed by Mike Tolan and written by Bill Bradley. And it is now streaming on Max, where I have watched it twice and will be watching it again. Joining us now is the highest scorer in Princeton basketball history, Rhodes Scholar, New York Knicks star with two championship rings, United States Senator, devoted father, and losing presidential candidate Bill Bradley. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me on, Lawrence. You know, I, I be, I'm beginning with losing, because in this story, there's very little losing. But there's a big loss in that presidential campaign that you had aimed at so carefully and modestly. And, um, and, it, and, and we see in this story that losing is a larger experience than winning. You just described winning as a kind of a 48-hour experience, uh, but the losing stayed with you for a while. Talk about that period. Well, um, I lost badly. 
And it went into a period of self-reflection where I began to think about who I was and what I wanted to do in the next part of my life. And uh, it was deeply enriching. Um, you know, it gave me a sense of myself in a way that I didn't have before. And it kind of guided me to follow the path that would be true to myself and pay attention to the wonders in the world. And um, it, it, it's hard to imagine this piece that you've done uh, without that loss shifting you into this more reflective mode. Well, I think that's right. I mean, uh, you know, this piece, uh, I didn't start out to do this piece. Somebody suggested to me it produced 72 plays on Broadway that after he heard me uh, talk about a few friends, I gave my papers to her, her Princeton, and they'd done oral history. And I stood up and talked about each one of them and told stories afterwards. He said, you know, it sounds a little bit like Hal Holbrook doing mm -hmm. Mark Twain. You ought to work something up. Mm -hmm. And so I did. It wasn't until that moment that I thought of doing this. And Spike Lee, big Knicks fan, comes on board. Frank Oz, great director, producer, Mike Tolan. And, and here I had a lot of angels. You did. Off. You did. Here we are. Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, there was a great moment um, the, in the <clears throat> Finance Committee conference room, which if, if you're watching a, a Senate hearing on C-SPAN, there's a door right behind the chairman. And through that door is a very big lovely, what you'd expect, conference room for the Senate Finance Committee. I was walking by in 1994 when you were doing an interview with the Washington Post about our legislative uh, environment, which looked pretty grim at the time. And you were, you were giving all the accurate answers, and the reporter kind of said, well, it looks pretty grim. And you said, I heard you say this, and I'm going to read it from the Washington Post where they printed it. You said, I'm in the optimism business. I can't afford to see only the dark side of things. And I heard that out of this year as I was going back in the committee room. I'm in the optimism business. And I realized I wasn't and I never had been. And it was the first moment I began to think of optimism as something other than naive. What, what allows you to, to hang on to optimism and in, in this environment, for example, that we're in now? Well, you know, I think we can learn a lot from what made our Nick team successful so many years ago. Like take responsibility for yourself, respect your fellow human being, disagree with them openly, honestly, civilly, enjoy their humanity. And then what my grandmother said, never look down on somebody you don't understand. And so it starts with a set of values of what you believe about what is possible. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons I did this film was to try to create some healing in the country, very divided. And yet I was so personal because I wanted to encourage other people to tell their stories. And if that happens, we find that there's a common humanity that we all share. And it's that common humanity that I'm betting on, not r and D. I'm betting on a common mm -hmm. humanity. Uh, when you... Uh, when you look at the way governing is happening now, I mean, I look at it and I, I certainly don't recognize it from the time that we were there. And by the way, when, when we were there in the 1990s, we thought this is as hard as it gets. We thought it was as bad as yeah. it gets. Right? Money, money was doing it. Yeah, right. we thought it can't get worse than this. Right. And, and still, you, we could do things. You could do things. You could get things done and you could you could do reasonable things with Bob Dole, the Republican uh, majority leader who was a member of the Senate Finance Committee. Um, and now what do you see when you look at it? Well, it's not like we can't get things done. I mean, mm -hmm. President Biden's got a big infrastructure mm -hmm. bill done, mm -hmm. got a chips bill that will create thousands of manufacturing jobs. He's, you know, limiting how, what people have to pay on some of the drug costs. So we can get things done. It's just the atmosphere is poisoned in some way by partisanship and social media. And these, in some cases, the Republicans are not bad people. They just need more courage to stand up for what they truly believe, as opposed to just caving to whatever the pressure is at the moment. And I think Democrats have to reach out and get to know people as human beings. When Cory Booker, for example, went to the Senate for the first time, he asked me what he should do. I said, make five Republican friends, really friends. Mm -hmm. Once you do, they'll find out a way to help you. And sure enough, what happened, he introduced the foster care bill because he'd walked, he'd visited with all these Republicans, Senator M. Hoff of uh, Oklahoma, very conservative. He saw that he had two adopted kids. So he said to him, would you co-sponsor the bill? He did. Got other Republicans. It's now the law of the land. 
So the point is, don't underestimate the human spirit. Don't underestimate our common humanity. Even in a world where it seems to be polluted or poisoned, that's not the case. That's not who we are as Americans. Uh, Joe Biden seemed to start his presidency with that Bradley optimism, and, and he got a lot of criticism for it. There were people who thought, oh, you don't understand. These aren't the Republicans you dealt with before. You're not going to get anything done. I privately believed Joe Biden wasn't going to get anything done. I was wrong. You were wrong. Uh, I was very wrong. Uh, and, and you were probably not surprised at what Joe Biden was able to accomplish. I was not surprised. I know who Joe Biden is. And I know what he believes about legislation, legislating. I know what he believes about the American people and his colleagues. And so sometimes what seems impossible, because we project the worst on a situation, mm -hmm. we just don't see the whole picture. It's like seeing only part of the court. To see the whole court, you got to see what's possible. And to me, that is the genius of real leadership. Yeah, it, that line you said about I'm in the optimism business, it, it was the first time I thought that I need needed to widen my frame. I was always the worst case scenario guy, so I could always tell you how we were going to lose. I couldn't always tell you how we were going to win. Yeah. Uh, and there's a line that you have in here in, in, in this piece that is uh, relevant to that. You say that you grew up uh, in that small town in Missouri with you, you use this phrase protected from sophistication. Uh, and there I was growing up in Boston where we didn't think of ourselves as sophisticated, but the last thing we wanted to be was naive. So, you know, you, we were the first ones to figure out the negative side of everything. But you were protected from that. You were protected from sophistication. Right. There, there, there are two parts to that. Protected from sophistication and propelled by dreams. Those are two important things. Yes, I was uh, naive, you might say. But um, that's because I didn't hesitate to believe in the possibility of the human spirit. And I still don't um, hesitate to believe in that for our country, for our politics. And now we live in difficult times, no question about that. And um, our, the, the, president, the former president is certainly not helping things. But my view is that's a, that's a small part of who we are as a people. And ultimately, it's a narrow part. And it's a part that drags us down to our worst selves as opposed to propels us forward to our best selves. Uh, we learn in your film that when you were 52 years old and your mother was in the final weeks of her life, uh, she said to you, uh, Bill, you've been a good boy. Uh, I just want to take this moment to say you've been a good senator. You've been good at everything you've ever done. It's an honor to know you, honor to have you here tonight. Well, I feel that about you, Lawrence. So it's an honor to be here with you and talk about this. Bill Bradley, thank you very much for everything you've done, every way you helped me when we were working together. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. We'll be right back. The great Bill Bradley gets tonight's last word.